Hi, church. Hi, everybody that's watching from home. And thank you so much again, worship band. It's uh, every day, no, not every day, every weekend is such a blessing. And I'm blessed to be part of the staff and I get to be here. <laughs> and so many people want to be here. Um, so it's a bittersweet thing. And Leslie, you were right. It's all about Jesus when you said it's all about him. Everything points to Jesus. The whole Bible points towards Christ and his work, his redemptive work, work, how he bought us. He's paid for us the ransom, the fee to set us free, indeed, in him. And um, we're finishing Daniel, and it's a bittersweet thing as well. It's, uh, I kind of want to continue We've been learning so much. I have been learning so much. And, uh, but now it's coming to a close. And especially with chapter 12, there's a couple of lines that I have had to labor over and think about and rethink. And when it says in James chapter 3, verse 1, that not many of us should become teachers because we will be judged more strictly, I uh, think about that often. And so just so you know, uh, it's a labor of love, but at the same time, I'm keenly aware of that I'm human and I can fall short. <laughs> uh, so it's not something that we, or Donovan, or Daryl, or Paul, it doesn't matter who's speaking, we don't flippantly throw these things together and think that we have it. It's a, it's a labor of love, uh, but at the same time, we do take this seriously. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, so I'll just jump right into it. But first of all, I want to pray. Um, I thank you, Father, for this building. I thank you for the internet. I thank you for technology that we can communicate this way for right now. I pray that COVID will be over soon, that we can get back to life, that we can congregate together, that we can fellowship together. Uh, I thank you for the lesson of not taking things for granted that uh, once things return, that we do not take it for granted, that we treasure, treasure these moments together, and that we actually learn to relax and enjoy being together, not always looking for the next thing. In Jesus' name, and this is all, everything that we're doing here, both the worship band, uh, technicians in the back, the sermon, everything, people online, it's actually all, all to worship God. It's all for God's glory. It's not for mine um, or us that you see here on stage. It's actually to elevate Christ, not us. So chapter 12, uh, great scholars that know a lot more than I do, that's for sure, do believe that the later half of chapter 11, anything from verse 35 and after, and chapter 12 is still talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. That could be correct, I'm not throwing that off the table, but personally, I just don't see it that way. <laughs> and then we have different kinds of scholars that uh, relocate much of Daniel into the future, that it's future still. They claim that the last few chapters have been building up to a great end time climax between good and evil. The Antichrist, the seven-year Great Tribulation, the Rapture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, it just got me thinking uh, because I'm blessed with being able to do this for a living. <laughs> Meet people, study God's word, and talk about the scriptures. What if Daniel is not trying to provide us a roadmap for the end times? What if Daniel is not? written to us in 2021, but actually for us. So we so often, and I'm guilty of this, probably every day, all the time, approaching Scripture with uh, the idea or the question, well, how does this affect me? <laughs> um, it's often about me, 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 me. And honestly, what I've learned through Daniel, and I've been learning for the last few years as well, is that that's the wrong approach. It's actually all about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Not me, 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 me. And that's a humbling experience because I think that I'm pretty unique and special. <laughs> but uh, on the grand scheme of things, I am not. And so, just as I believe Daniel 9 points towards Jesus, 
not a future Antichrist, I think chapter 12 does as well. And I want to reiterate that statement. What if the things described in the last four verses of Daniel 9 are actually about Jesus? But most popular end-time theologians for the last few decades say it's about the Antichrist. Okay, so think about this for a second. Ascribing the fulfilled work of Jesus to the Antichrist is a cause for concern. At least we should stop and think about that. And we need to remember that the Old Testament was pointing towards Jesus. And what does the New Testament do? Again, points towards Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, and his return. That's the amazing thing. He will return. Well, then me as a pastor... How do I understand chapter 12? And I'm not here to indoctrinate anybody. I'm here to teach and educate. But what you do with it is up to you. But I don't think the text is about us. And I don't think it's a roadmap for the end times or for 2021. In my last sermon, I alluded to uh, the end of Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and I think chapter 12 is the chronological progression of these things. Because if you look at chapter 11, the rulership of Israel went from Antiochus Epiphanes, the evil one, to the Romans. They were not much better, just different. And verse 1 in Daniel chapter 12 can help us understand where on the timeline this is occurring. Let's read the first three verses. That's kind of probably going to be my focus for my last sermon in Daniel. Verse 1. At that time. Not future. Not, well, in, for us, it's in the past. <laughs> but at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress, such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. Those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. At that time is key for me. I put that time in the past. I reckon that this is actually talking about 70 AD when the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed. But many situate at that time in chapter 12 into the future. And then everything in chapter 11 after verse 35 is talking about a future Antichrist. Not the Roman occupation in Jesus' time, which I think Daniel is pointing towards is Jesus and his time. Because at that time, according to many today, is future still. And if you've studied Daniel at any time, or if you've searched for Daniel chapter 12 or 9, etc., on YouTube or Google, what you get is mostly results that echo this belief that it's all future still. And it made me wonder. And this used to be how I interpreted Daniel as well. And it's, uh, I wonder if we want to believe it is true because it involves us. We are involved. It's about me. It gives us, me, peace and a sense of safety that the Bible is talking about our end of the age. It gives us answer to some questions that we have. I need to ask, and I'm going to ask this. Do we actually need any more sense of peace and safety than being children of God? Do we need any more than that, that the sovereign ruler that holds everything in, their, in his hands and we're his, his kids, do we need any more than that? Many see a great tribulation in chapter 12, that's future, and the rapture of the saints of the earth before God's wrath is re released for the seven years. And... Because of that, that's the popular opinion, 
I'll give you a short introduction on the pre-tribulation theory. A theory which presupposes a great tribulation. And I think it's good to understand where it came from. Because many in the West have deep convictions on this doctrine. And they think it's been orthodox since the early church. And all the way through church history. But that isn't so. So the two-stage coming of Christ, notice that Jesus doesn't come once at the end. He comes twice, according to this theory. It was first introduced in 1812 by a Jesuit priest, Emmanuel Lacunza. In verses 11 and 12 in chapter 12, we see a 45-day 45 difference, 45 difference between the days mentioned. And Lacunza, he wrote that there would be a 45-day interval between the coming of Christ for the saints and his second return to judge the wicked. And then in 1826, a few years later, Edward Irving, a highly influential Scottish preacher, translated Lacunza's work from Spanish and taught the similar thing, but he actually extended the interval from 45 days to three and a half years. But he also pu published that Jesus would return in 1864. So, oh well. <laughs> that was clearly wrong. So, and then the third person, which actually took both these ideas and adopted it and made it into what we have today. And this person is highly influential and has shaped and created much of how the West interprets the Bible. And how we un understand the end times. This one man created the doctrinal template of the fundamentalist branch of the North American Evangelical Church. In 1830, John Nelson Darby incorporated the two states coming of Christ into his new dispensational system. But he extended the length of the interval from three and a half years to the now known seven years. And that's where we get the seven years from. And so many other doctrines that we take for granted now as truth that was actually never taught by the early church or the reformers or the Catholic church um, before him, he actually implemented and started to teach a lot of these things that we now take as truth. But uh, now you have kind of the gist of the pre-rapture theory and where it came from. So let's continue with Daniel. Let's go back to verse 1. At that time, Michael the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress, such as, such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. It's like, oh, so many questions there. What does that mean? So Michael stands watch over your people. God's people, who are they? And we just assume, okay, it's the collective Israel. It's the nation of Israel. But God's people has always been the remnant, the true believers, the covenant faithful who love God. God's people are those who have a circumcised heart. And it's not based on genealogy, race, or where you live. It's do you love God or not? So there will be a time of distress such as never has occurred. We read that and we've been taught to read the Bible literally, which is one of the foundational evangelical doctrines that came from John Darby and is a core tenant in his system. Well, I think the Bible has more freedom than that because the Bible uses idioms, sarcasm, parables, different literally, literary devices such as exaggerating things, being hyperbolic to intentionally draw your attention to something in the text. And we do that all the time. I could eat a horse. It's like I have never seen a person eat a whole horse. It just means that you're really hungry. And the writers of the Bible have the same freedom that we have today when we speak. And that's what's happening here. It's drawing attention to the magnitude of the situation in a symbolic kind of a way. It's not trying to draw a straight comparison to what happened in 70 AD and World War II or World War II and other conflicts. It's not. It's talking about the cataclysmic event of 70 AD. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. What is that referring to? 
Again, who are the people of God? It's the people written in the book of life. Your name is not written in the book of life based on ethnicity or who your family is. It has always been based on faithfulness. Are you covenantly, faithfully walking with God? Do you walk with him or not? It says that they will escape. Is Daniel talking about a future rapture of the saints at the end of days or something else? Is it a prophecy that was fulfilled supernaturally in the past or does it apply to a future generation still? If we look at Luke 19 verses 43 and 44, we actually read about Jesus himself warning the Christians about what would take place. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. And who's that? That's Jesus. In chapter 21 in Luke, verses 20 and 22, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that its desolation has come near. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those inside the city must leave it, and those who are in the country must not enter it. Because these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all the things that are written. Part of Daniel, it's part of things that are written. And Jesus calls Daniel the prophet. And these things must happen in this generation because all these things are fulfill being fulfilled because they denied God. They did not recognize the time of God when he visited them. It's pretty clear when we start to interpret Scripture with Scripture. That's what I'm excited about. <laughs> but everybody should make up their own mind. And I'm sure the Christians in Jerusalem at that time remember Jesus' words when they saw the, saw the Roman military leader Vespasian actually come and surround Jerusalem. I wonder if they thought, oh, Jesus warned us. He was a true prophet. It is happening. It is real. But now it's too late. We blew it. But by God's grace, he was called back to Rome and the army withdrew with him. See, Rome had an internal struggle at that time, and he went back to Rome, and because he was a, a great military leader, he became the next Roman emperor for the ten, next 10 years. I believe his withdrawal was a window of time given by God so that the true believers who had their names written in the book of life could actually vacate Jerusalem. Early church fathers wrote that the Christians fled to Pella. Who fled? Those who had their names written in the book of life. And it was a fulfillment of both Daniel's prophecy and Jesus' prophecy. And then, because not just soon after Vespasian left, his son Titus came, returned to Jerusalem, and destroyed the city and the temple. But it gave them a window of time to leave, to flee to the mountains. It's amazing. Let's continue and read verse 2. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal content. Many read this as a future resurrection at the end of time when Jesus returns. And so listen carefully, everybody here and online. Of course we believe in a future resurrection of the saints. When Jesus returns on the last day. I don't want any emails about that. <laughs> we believe that. But, there's the but. Is, this is a question. Is Daniel talking about that? Or is he alluding to something else that makes sense when we interpret the Old Testament with the, their lens? And how the Old Testament prophets saw the Messiah and the change he would usher in. It's easy for us now contemporary Christians with all our knowledge in Google, to actually take an Old Testament text 
that calls and talks about resurrection or becoming awake and infuse the symbolism with a systematic way of understanding things. That's what we like today. X always equals X. We like that approach. It's simple. And we like to take things literally because that's what we've been taught by the church. But we remember Jesus and the apostles in Matthew 16. There's so many things that I could quote right now when people are misunderstanding what Jesus is saying. Verse 6, then Jesus told them, watch out and be, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were discussing among themselves, we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> it's so easy to miss the point. Immediately they start looking for bread. Where is the baker? Totally missing the symbolic point Jesus was making. I only bring that up so we don't fall into the same trap. We read awake, or resurrection, and we assume X. And we infuse the symbolism with our understanding and start looking for a baker. Could Daniel actually be talking about something else? So maybe instead of looking at the text and asking the question, how does this affect me? Does it point towards my future? Where is Canada? Where is the States? Uh, where is my involvement? Instead, we should wonder, how is this pointing towards Christ? I think Daniel is continuing the theme of Daniel 9, about the work of Christ during his first coming and what he achieved. It says, many who sleep in the dust, we know from the New Testament that everyone, not many, will be raised on the last day. Everyone, not many. Some to eternal life, others face judgment. That's the first clue that is, this is referring to something else than when Christ returns and everyone is raised. What could Daniel be referring to? We must remember that Daniel was reading Jeremiah, pretty awesome, who was a little bit older than he was, and Jeremiah's ministry ended as soon as Daniel's ministry started. Talk about providence, pretty cool. Um, that tells us he was reading the Old Testament scrolls and the connection in verses 22 and 3, which I just read from Daniel chapter 12. There's so many connections with Isaiah 53. The suffering servant figure is evident. And you don't actually have to take my word for it. This is pointed out by many different Hebrew scholars, and not me. So <laughs> you can rest in that, and even Jews. So Jewish scholars and Christian scholars that actually speak, write, and read Hebrew, which I don't. See, the linguistic links between verses 2 and 3 in Daniel chapter 12 show an understanding of Isaiah 53 that Daniel had, which is amazing because it shows us again that it's about Jesus Christ. The suffering servant is resurrected and restored to a relationship with God. And in him, his people will be resurrected and restored to a relationship with him, the Father. Let's look at a short portion of Isaiah 53. And if I can recommend it, read later today Isaiah 52 and 53 and look at verses 2 and 3 in Daniel chapter 12 and think about these verses and see the connection between the two. Verse 10 in Isaiah 53. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, many righteous servants will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities." Amazing text. So many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. We read in Isaiah 53 that he will justify many, many again, not everyone. If you accept Christ, he will bear your iniquities. If you don't want him to, well, he's not going to. God crushed him, making his life an offering for sin but he will see his offspring and prolong his days. 
The Father resurrected the Son, His Son. Jesus was the first fruit. We are His offspring. And in Christ, we awake to an eternal life, others to disgrace. See, John chapter 5, verse 24 says, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. He has passed from death to life. Present tense. If you're in Christ now, present tense, you have eternal life. You have passed from death to life. There's so much in uh, the New Testament that actually uh, gives us the revelation on how on these things that are obscure and clouded and difficult to understand that prophets saw. They saw dimly, and we still see dimly, but we have more revelation that they had because Christ has been here. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 says that he was made alive with Christ even though, no, it says that he has made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses, you were saved by grace. We, before, before we were awakened, resurrected, we were dead. Dead in trespasses and sin. In Christ, we are now awakened, resurrected, spiritually alive with him. Partaking in a different kingdom. I believe Daniel is continuing that theme of pointing to the Messiah. Verse 4 said that, says that many will roam about and knowledge will increase. I think he's referring to that history unfolds and we understand prophecy. And that their prophecy, Daniel's and Jesus, have been proven correct. Our understanding that we have today is actually a blessing. Because if you read Daniel chapter 12, he asks Please give me revelation. Please give me understanding. I want knowledge. I want to know what this means. But now we know knowledge will increase. I'll just briefly address the last few parts of Daniel chapter 12 because of time. Uh, but you, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end. It's interesting when we compare that with with uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10, which says, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. It's the opposite of what Daniel is told to do. And when we read in Daniel to seal the book until the time of the end, we must ask the question, until the end of what? <laughs> I think Daniel is referring to Jesus and his work. Think back to Daniel chapter 9. He ushered in a new covenant. The old one is no more. He expanded the kingdom of God to include all nations, all peoples. The temple worship ended. And so many other things. That was a time of the end. That age ended and another age was took place and started, and these things were fulfilled in Christ. Nothing is replaced, Christ fulfills. Verse 10 says, Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. I think this is expanding on verses two and three, many will be purified. They will awake. They will have insight. And in Christ will gain insight and shine like the bright expanse of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You can awake and arise in Christ as a new creation right now. Or you can choose to continue to act wickedly. And not have understanding of Jesus Christ. And so I want to end with that. And Donovan can come up. I think uh, Daniel chapter 12 and Daniel in general has been amazing. Amazing journey. And uh, I hope that you've learned many things. And started to get excited about scripture, study, rethink these things. Maybe not even rethinking them. But it's been a delight. And I look forward to our next sermon series.
All right. Well, thank you, Armand, for that. I just want to also say what a, what a pleasure it has been to co-teach together. That has not been something that we've ever done before, um, but lots of bouncing back and forth, lots of great conversations that have come as a result of it, and it's been really fun to do that together. So thank you for all the work. You did a, so much work in studying and reading, and it hasn't just been right now. This is over the course of many years, but really good. So thank you for that. Uh, before I get into uh, my part here to end off today's service, uh, I just wanted to just acknowledge as well that Britt, um, our former youth pastor now, as of Friday, her, uh, her assignment here at Anchor Point has come to a close. At this juncture, she is now officially done. She is uh, on mat leave and doesn't have a second baby yet that is out of the womb, but will be coming. And uh, she has just done a tremendous amount of work uh, here at the church for the kingdom of God. Uh, from starting with a, with a small group of youth, a half a dozen maybe, uh, up to 55 or so with a dozen or more leaders that are there connected in that way, uh, really, really faithfully has poured out. And the number of times that it was late evenings or early mornings or s- some young people that are struggling through something need someone to talk to, someone that's going to care for them, uh, going to youth's homes late at night uh, to work with parents and family together with youth. Uh, she's really poured um, so much time and attention into it, always being willing. And uh, she's poured that into her, the, the DNA that Britt has has been poured into the leaders. It's part of what we have here as a church as well. And so Britt, if you are listening right now or later on, I'm not quite sure, uh, a real joy and treat to work together with you all these years. Uh, it's a privilege to call you a co-laborer in Christ. And uh, thank you for that. I'm really glad that it's not over. I'm really thankful that it's actually just another phase or another part, uh, the end. Um, the, which end are we talking about for Britt right now? It's the end of formally being youth pastor here at Anchor Point. And so uh, really good. Armand and I, um, we know that you've talked with us about the name that you want for your, your son. And you're debating, is it Donovan Armand or Armand Donovan? And um, I want to suggest Armavin, <laughs> I think. I think that would be a really great name, Don, Don, Don Mon. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, maybe not. Anyway, lest we digress, I want to pray for Britt, and so would you bow your heads with me, and let's pray, and then we'll, I'll do my part on Daniel 12. God, uh, there's a, it's always a bittersweet, these types of things, but thank you, God, for putting a zeal inside of Britt. Thank you, God, for her commitment to serving you and following you. Thank you, God, from young Uh, Your spirit was upon her. And God made the decision from early on, I just want to live wholehearted for Jesus. And uh, God, that is evident. Thank you for the work. Thank you for the evidence of your spirit alive in her. Thank you for the growth and transformation over the years, even just here, God, as she has grown in maturity, grown in a, a love and a desire to know you. God, at a young age, God, thank you that it was such a good example and model Um, She can truly say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and it's not perfection. It is to seek you, the living God. Thank you that she knows this in the innermost part of her. God, I ask that your spirit goes before uh, Jason and Britt as they can continue on the journey, as they're going to have a second baby in their home or a child in their home. God, would you grant them wisdom? Would you give them favor, Jesus, with their neighbors and community, God, as they minister in that way? Uh, Thank you, God. Thank you. God, I pray a rich blessing upon them. God, would you care for them um, spiritually? God, would you care for them physically, uh, financially, Jesus? Would you care for them, God, as they give care to their children? Would you give them wisdom beyond their years, God, in raising children to serve you and follow you, God? So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for them. In your name we pray. Amen. So Daniel chapter 12. Um, Armand, thank you for highlighting this again for us today and walking us through this. Throughout this series, my privilege has been coming back to the character of Daniel and uh, his love and trust in God himself, his, his downright amazing godliness and commitment to God. Faithful and wise would be words that we would um, give or we've overly or come back to often. These are the things for him. There are many times that he could have chosen, I think, to go along with the rest of the wise people in Babylon. Uh, he could have compromised at any point. There was lots of reason that he could have, or at least maybe not have been fully honest. He could have kept maybe some of the harshest or boldest parts of the prophecy. He could have maybe softened the blow just a little bit. Um, and in reading it, you're like, oh man, if he's wrong on this interpretation of the dream, or this, if he's wrong, he's duped. 
And yet somewhere, God um, faithfully walked with him through all of these things. And he didn't lose his character in the midst of being faithful to God, being tested already very, very early on in his age uh, as a young man. The negative cost had the potential to be very great for him. Um, but instead, what it's done is it's given us this really beautiful insight now that we get to study, some thousands of years later, we get to study and say, oh man, there is someone who's discipled me in character and trust in the living God. He goes through many leaders, many kings as his leader. Um, he has to earn the trust seemingly over and over and over and over again. But I began to think, him being one of the most brilliant and trusted and godly advisors to have probably ever lived, was he ever disappointed? Like, was he disappointed in God? Was he disappointed that God didn't come and rescue? Was he disappointed in, in the Jewish people, like his people? Was he disappointed in himself? Did he ever question, like, God, where are you? Am I getting it right? Why am I in this kingdom? Should I have been gone? I am certain these are things that went on inside of him. Can imagine the potential disappointment of the kingdom still being ungodly, the future being grim, God, is this not enough? Like, I'm hearing you and you're saying still like a long way to go before there's going to be any hope. And I can imagine these things that would have been inside of him. I can imagine in his humanness, what am I doing, God? Is it worth it, God? Is there a different plan, God? Did I miss the action step, God? The kings don't listen to me, God. When is enough? Now, we don't get to see the insight we get to read the, the glory story of Daniel. Yet in the book of Daniel, we see like 60 some odd years of his life. But Daniel, again, seems to have this incredible ability to trust God. It's like the longer he lives, the greater and more clear, clear the picture becomes for him from the lion's den and how he would respond right through into his 80s. I had this picture years ago that someone had shared with me about trust. Imagine the ocean and there's all these people who are windsurfing on the ocean. And uh, people are wearing all sorts of safety gear, which is good to have. You have wetsuits and life jackets. Your, your foot is tethered to the board in case you go down. And whatever it is, you have these things in place, except for one woman. And she is further out than the rest, and she is hitting waves and wind that no one else is hitting, but she has no life jacket. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that vehicle go by, but I just wanted to know that they were here because it's all about them. <laughs> anyway, she's all by herself, and uh, she's going against all the norms of windsurfing without a life jacket, without the tether, doesn't have a, a wetsuit on, just enjoying the, the beautiful sun and the rays and the wind and the power of the wind. And all around, people are yelling and shouting, panicking on her behalf, even though she is not panicking. It's like, you're too far out. <laughs> Be careful, it's too dangerous. And these great and important warnings. And yet for her, it doesn't seem to be a care in the world, fully confident in her ability. Supposing, perhaps in the illustration, that the windsurf board maybe is an example of the safety and security that she would feel would be like us on Jesus. I know the analogy doesn't go all the way, but there's a trust that she would have in the ocean that no one else seems to have. To many, it would seem crazy what she's doing, far too dangerous, and yet the freedom and the beauty of watching someone without any fear accomplish things. I don't know if you get a kick out of watching these videos of people like way up high on buildings on a little ledge and they do a backflip and they make it, and it's like, you're like, they they probably should die and inside my stomach is turning even though I know the video is made and produced. But there's like something and yet they're so confident, these free runners. And there's a beauty, like we want to watch it but we want to scream, don't do it. I wonder if this is like a trust in God like Daniel has. We have these voices, right? Like Daniel seems to like not have the voices there anymore. Maybe his trust early on but it's like these voices of reason. People saying, no, 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 be careful. This is how you are a good Christian. This is how you live wholehearted. But are we living by the Spirit? Are we living for the kingdom of God no matter the cost, free and alive like a windsurfer? 
I don't mean that we shouldn't receive counsel, but I wonder if before we go to the Lord, before we abide in the Spirit, we want to receive all the wise counsel and more than happy to give it or all those who have been in the faith for a long time to give every warning possible to ensure that you will always be protected at all costs and never ever will you run into any problems or difficulties. That is a really poor example of Christian faith. It's interesting, again, that the stories that we like to share with others are not the stories of safety, right? The person who like walks down the sidewalk but doesn't run, takes the path that is most beaten and most traveled. No, no, we love the stories of those that are radicals in the faith and we love to share them, but for some reason, we bring it back and say, but don't live that way. Don't live wholehearted because I think we have a wrong perspective of what it means to have faith or trust in God. Now, the illustration of the windsurfer can fall apart at some level, but to not live in fear and not be bound. In the church, we have often called things wisdom when perhaps it's actually justifying our fear, justifying our selfishness, justifying our wants and our desires, justifying these things. And maybe sometimes we're not fully honest with the why we have these things told a story before. I'm going to share it again. My daughter, Michaela, when she was younger, she wanted to go on a sleepover with a bunch of friends that I didn't know for a birthday party. I don't know. She was in middle school somewhere. My immediate answer was a resounding nope, because that would be the wise thing. I was not comfortable with her going to a birthday party and a sleepover with people that I didn't know. Wisdom, right? Good dads would do this. Michaela goes and asks her mom, and her mom says that she needs to talk this one through with dad because dad had said no. So, Michaela doesn't have the same reasons. I mean, Kendra doesn't have the same reasons why I did, but she didn't go around and be like, no, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, I'll talk to your dad. You're going to be able to go. No, no, we're a team together. You need to go talk to your dad. I told Michaela I couldn't talk to her. She needed to go to bed, and I needed to sort through the answer to her question of, why can't I go? But why, dad? Kendra and I talked, and I realized that I had heard way too many stories as a youth pastor in my youth ministry days of kids and youth going to sleepovers, and in that time, someone gets curious sexually or someone gets curious in some way and does something to someone who was innocent at that time, and they're compromised at some level for the rest of their life, and now two, three, five, and ten years later, the repercussions of one sleepover have enough to put them into guilt and shame, binding them forever. So my answer was to protect my daughter from all harm and potential harm. Wisdom, right? So I went and told her that I was actually afraid for her to go to the sleepover. Fear of her getting hurt. Fear of loosening my grip that way. Fear based on what people had told me. Interestingly enough, when I told her these things, she had empathy for me. And she's like, oh, Dad, that makes sense on why you don't want me to go. But dad, that won't be my story. This won't be what happens to me. Like, I'm not going to go there and allow it. I'm like, well, what would you do if someone tried something that would hurt you? Dad, I would just get up and I would stop it. Would you call me? Of course I would call you. It's like, ah. And it's like, Michaela, like, I have no reason. I've never had reason not to trust you. But the reason why I didn't want her to go was for me, not for her. And so as we talked it through and discussed this thing in the end, I said, Michaela, I want you to go. Can you promise me, knowing what dad is feeling, that if anything even remotely goes on, you'll call me. You you will give dad a call. I'll be awake. I'll have my phone ready. I'll come get you at any moment. And she's like, dad, of course I would do that. And so she went and released her to go as she's getting older. Nothing happened. Everything was great. I called it wisdom, but the truth of the matter is that it was fear, and I could justify it as wisdom. See, I can't control my children on every move, even though some points I want to, because if I can protect them at all costs, then they're going to make it, but that's not the Christian way. The Christian way is not that way. We're not supposed to call things wisdom that are actually fear. We're to be honest and real, and Michaela and I came to a decision together in absolute honesty. It's a miracle. And it worked. This is the great challenge of any parent releasing their children. Sometimes in the church, I think we become so good at discipling people 
that we actually desire and believe that discipleship is I'm going to protect you from every error. Not the case. We actually, I think, need to release people more and more, trusting that God is going to take them on a marvelous journey and that in the times of trouble, there's going to be the Spirit of God is going to come and rescue. The, 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 the angel Michael is going to come to speak to them. There's going to be the, the closing of mouths in the lion's den and faith will actually grow, not the other way around. Not fear. And then we, as the wise, get to get on our knees and pray that they will turn to God in their distress. Can you imagine Daniel's parents? (laughs) I thought about this this week. It's like, oh yeah, son is top of the class, most brilliant among the Jews, promising student, clearly going to be picked or marked or at least potentially to lead the children of Israel one day as a great prophet or at least knowledgeable in the ways of the Lord. Excellent in everything he did. We don't actually know, but at some point Daniel gets taken as a young man into the most wicked of nations. And you can imagine, I have basically four teenagers, I can't imagine them being taken away from me into another nation, another land where I can't do anything. And yet Daniel, it was no problem, faithful to the end because he knew the king, he knew God. He knew and feared the Lord, didn't fear man. He lived in wisdom. Death had no hold. And I can imagine the early days of the things going on, the the challenges that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have gone through would have been so deeply impactful in their faith that in all the rest of their lives, from the radical faith as young people, they would never doubt again whether they could trust God or not. Many years ago, I was praying for my family and I was confronted with a thought that wasn't very good. What would happen if one of my children sensed a call from the Lord to go to the mission field? I don't mean mission field as in like, go to Steinbeck. (laughs) No, what if it was to go where the gospel had never gone before? What if it would cost them their life? What if it would mean I would never see them on this earth again? Would I let them go? Would I become a roadblock? Would I press them hard to reconsider and go get more wisdom and go get more wisdom and seek more counsel and you should ask a few more people, would I be that one or would I encourage and would I support? God, send someone else, not my own child. Are my ideals more valuable than the Lord's ideals? Just stay here. Have some children. Let me become a granddaddy. I'm going to get my grandpa bus. It's going to be great. I had to resolve that it would be worth it because the gospel must go forth. I had to choose to trust God, that his plan was better, that his very heart, actually the indicator that my children are serving the Lord would be, God, wherever you would want me to go, I'm in, yes and amen. My selfishness was like, please God, no. But you're confronted with his heaven for real. Would we be united together again one day? That many had died for their faith beforehand and very likely the reason why I am here in love with God is because someone gave up their life to go to a land where no one knew of the gospel so that me, a Gentile in a place called Canada, the gospel would have come. And I can say that it's not that, but someone gave up their life that way for the heart of the kingdom of God. The cost was everything. What's God's heart? That none should perish and all should come to repentance? Is that really what I desire? Or do I just want that for everyone else? Not my anchor point people, not my family, but from other churches. They should go, but we'll keep us, right? And we have this mentality. If you think about like small groups, no, 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 no. Like once I get my crew, I just want to keep my crew, right? I I don't, don't disrupt it. And we forget sometimes that the very heart of God is to go, Be led by the Spirit. It's not to gather the believers to protect them. It's to encounter God and go. That people would know Him. But our hearts sometimes are so selfish. And this is like the the book of Daniel. It's like we want it to be about me instead of to be about Him. I've been inspired by so many in the church who've 
live through this pandemic in a way that builds my faith. I chatted with Matt and Twyla last night at our leaders' night. They live in a condo. There's over 40 suites. Uh, they had already met over 20 different people, and they bring cooking and baking, and they have supper clubs, and that they've made this decision that this is the way they're going to go. And Twyla threw a pizza party early on, and only three people came. And she's like, that's it, God. I need to know my neighbors, and is committed to doing this. But it takes trusting God. It takes keeping your eyes on the kingdom. It takes your time. It takes your thought. It takes your prayer life, and it takes your sleep but it actually gives you joy and it gives you life because you have purpose. You say, God, how? How do you want to use me for your kingdom? God, we need more people like Daniels who anywhere they go, they bring the light. It's the everlasting or the, or the, the light that goes from everlasting or forever and forever that is spoken of here. Those that lead many into righteousness, they're going to shine in that way to hear from God and respond to him. What do you do about this? If you haven't heard God, I think that also incapacitates. I was like, well, God hasn't told me what to do. Well, actually, he has to love him and to love your neighbor. He actually has told, and you're not sure, just reach out to one person. Be like, Let's know God together. You're permitted to do that. Find one. Find two and say, let's grow to know God. I'm so hungry and I'm so desperate. Please, just one. It is all about him. It needs to be. Do we think that Daniel had everything that he needed to become the great prophet when he was a teenage boy? Or did God call him and as he went, God gave him everything he needed? I think it's actually like that. I think if we had everything we needed and God called us, then we actually wouldn't need God because we had all of our own gifts. But I think actually the way the spiritual gifts work is God calls, we freak out. We're like, we can't do it. God's like, I'll give you what you need when you need it. Now go. And then as you go, he gives you what you need. But why would he waste it when we're not going to use it? Actually, we need to trust in him. We get to the end of Daniel's life, this great servant of the Lord. He's been given this amazing revelation, revealing details of all the different rulers and ways that the Jews are going to be impacted coming up to the Messiah and after the Messiah and to 70 AD. And he sees all of these things and God tells him all the secrets. And he's like, God, I don't understand. I don't understand all that is written in here. I I don't quite get it. And so he just asks God. God, what am I to do? He sees hundreds of years ahead in painstaking detail. He's like, I don't understand. He's like, oh, Daniel, this is what's going to happen, but I I have something for you. It's like all the questions he may have had, right? But it's like, God, am I enough? God, did I do enough? God, did I listen to what you wanted? All of these things. And now he gets to this point. He sees what the next hundreds of years are gonna look like. He doesn't know necessarily how it all maps out perfectly, but it's pretty accurate detail in here. And then God says, no, 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 Daniel, now you're going to rest. It's like, you've done what I asked. You've been faithful to me. You've been a wise man and the nation. Kings have followed and come to know me. Two times in chapter 12, God tells Daniel what to do. Go your way, Daniel. You've done really good, kid. That's my interpretation. (laughs) Seal up the scroll. You've completed your responsibility. Thank you for being faithful, Daniel. Thank you for being faithful. And he repeats it again. Now you're going to rest, Daniel. You're going to rest. It's like I wonder if that was the sweetest words after 60 some odd years of serving God in a wicked nation with many, many kings and lots of death and lots of chaos. He says, you're going to rest. You've done your job and now thousands of years we're still encouraged by it. We don't know how he dies, but we know for sure that the end for Daniel is rest. And so what do we do from here, church? In a few weeks, I'm going to begin, I guess, to prepare and equip us on how to grow to have faith like Daniel. So we're going to explore, again, faith. We're going to explore how do we apply it. We're going to explore the deep need for each of us to be a part of the body. We're going to look at what is the church and how does this work, especially now, the things that have transpired. What is the Lord saying? We're, we're in the midst of prayer and fasting for three weeks. We're starting week two today. Those who want to join, can send a message to Armand. Um, Info at your anchor point, we'll put you on there. But there's a deep need for us to learn how to become the body, how to become unified, 
how to grow in maturity, how to be equipped, and how do we minister one to another? How do we listen to the Spirit and go forth? How do we live a life like Daniel? Maybe the question comes back again to, do you at least in this time have someone, or two, or three, that you meet with regularly to pursue the Lord together, to discern his will, to be hungry together, to minister together? Do you have someone? Are you waiting for me to set something up for you? Because the kingdom of God will not go forth if we wait for someone to say, Donovan or pastor or someone, can you set it up for me? No, no, no. Hungry people pursuing God. You know people in the church, at least one. Call them up out of your fear. The worst case scenarios, they say, no, I'm already meeting with people. And then call someone else, get hungry and say, can we meet to know God together? I think it's a great way to start, to discern his will, to minister together. You want to do outreach? You want to go minister to people on the street? You, you want to do it? Well, call someone and say, do you want to learn how to share the gospel with people? It's like, how? I, I don't know. But let's ask them together. Let's meet. Let's do it. Imagine what that would look like. We have a number of people that have started to do this in our church in the last month or so, saying, let's grow together. We've got to hear some of the stories. I've got, had the joy yesterday morning to hear some. Maybe we can take advantage of this together. So we're going to get into that. Pastor Daryl's going to speak the next two weeks. It's going to give me a couple weeks to kind of get things sorted for the next series on, on the church, uh, which I'm excited to, uh, excited to share with you. And uh, so we're going to end with a, a song of worship. Daniel has been an incredible book for us to go through. Um, rich, rich for us to understand and go, all pointing to, to Jesus. And again, we don't have to be right on this, but in the pursuit of truth, I think there's some amazing things that we've discovered and that we've learned uh, in these weeks together. And so, dare to be a Daniel. I think there's a song that goes like that. Dare to be a Daniel. Let me pray. God, would you grant us faith? God, and trust in you. Jesus, would we... Get, be like Peter who gets out of the boat. We'll be like Daniel that, that goes into the lion's den, just being faithful to the things. God, would you teach us to be the windsurfer that isn't tied down, but we, we, just, we just go. God, that we would pursue you. We would pursue you together. God, I think that we've often put trust in some of the wrong places. God, would you help us put trust in you? Gathering a few, seeking after you, God ministering one to another, ministering to people around us, God. Thank you, God, for the life and testimony of our friend, our, our mentor, Daniel. Thank you that he wrote these things with such accuracy. Thank you, God, that we can trust you. Thank you that in all of this, we know that you are trustworthy. We know that you are sovereign. We know that you love us. We know that your nature is true. Thank you, God, for this time. In your name, amen.